Hey, what's up, guys? So as you probably figured out, I'm recording a lot of these a little bit ahead of time, um, which means that I can kind of get away with uh, sort of spoiling um, the research I've done on um, another game that I think looks a lot like uh, Clifford Van Beek's National Pastime game. Because by the time this video comes out, um, this post will be kind of ancient news. It'll be about a week old or so. So um, I'll give you a real quick look at this. So uh, what we're going to look at very first of all, as I get this other these other useless windows out of the way, um, is uh, we're going to take a quick look over here at, uh, first of all, those dice baseball games we talked about yesterday. If you didn't watch this video yesterday, you should probably check it out. This is a great blog post, by the way. Very, very well written um, very, and very informative. I learned a lot from it. Um, now, there is a difference between the types of games that you and I love to play and the type of dice baseball games that these are, right? This isn't just, oh, we use our imagination and kind of pretend that a guy hit well or that a guy hit poorly, right? These are games that are actually designed to get certain results from certain and players that uh, sort of match up with how they did in real life, which in my mind is a lot more interesting. However, um, what you need to understand and what I'm understanding more and more is that the first person to come up with that idea of not just having sort of a totally random baseball dice based game, but having one that's actually based on something in real life. Well, that was Clifford Van Beek. I mean, I'm, I'm still looking for somebody before him. And if you know about anything, let me know because I'll go look it up. So this is what Substack looks like when you're editing it, right? This is what this post looks like. And I was talking about, you know, the patent uh, before that came from uh, our good old friend uh, Clifford Van Beek. Well, it was Bill Stafford who uh, turned me on to a different patent that came from a, a guy named Charles M. Steele. Um, this is a, a patent application it was filled out in 1913, patented. Um, the patent was granted in October 13th, 1914. And this was for a game that um, went by two different names overall um, that used three dies. Remember, a lot of the games we were looking at here yesterday, when we scroll down here, used two dies. It used three dice, but they were played the same way, right? So 6-6-6 six, six, six was the highest roll you could get. 1-1-1 one, one, one would give you all of these different possibilities. If you add it up, this gives you 56 different possibilities. If he had used three dice of two colors, you'd have 216 possibilities. It'd be a little bit more interesting. There are no playing cards in this game, but as you can see from this photo, this looks a little bit familiar, right? It should look familiar to you if you've been paying attention right? Because it looks a little bit like this, right? So this is national pastime. This is what it looks like. This is a picture that comes from, um, I think, th th is this from the Hall of Fame write-up? This is from some write-up that I found online. Unfortunately, nobody thought of zooming in, right? And nobody thought of taking photographs again with better quality cameras. I mean, but whatever, you can see what's going on here, right? You have none on base, runner on first, runner on second, and so on, on and so forth. You have all eight of these possibilities here with a board that sort of folds up. It folds up like this, right? And then here you have the places where you can put your tokens to see who's on base and stuff like that. I mean, they have left field, center field, right field there, but you, there's nothing to do because there's no defense. Well, when you look at this game, what do you have? It's a very, very similar thing. You have uh, from none on bases to runner on first, second, third, runners on first and second, first and third, runners on second and third, and then base is full. Um, this game also folds up the same way. This is what it looks like when it's folded up. And there's a little box here that has, um, what does it have? It has these little tokens. So you can keep track of strikes and balls and outs and runs. And you can keep track of the guys who are on each base, right? And then you can keep track of the score here, I suppose. I'm not sure why you have runs here at the same time, but whatever. And um, the reason why is because these results, now this is not really easy to read, especially not in this format. But even if we were going to, let's see if we can do this, set large size. See, you can't really read it that well, but it's like one of this is a triple. There's one here that's going to be a strike, one that's going to be a ball, and so on and so forth. Um, that is very, very diff uh, very different, very similar to the results that we see here in the various very, very old dice baseball games, right? That's the thing about this. So what happened basically, this is what I think happened with Steele's game, is he took dice baseball and added another die and um, then marketed it like crazy. Right now, what I think happened with National Pastime is I think that at some point in time, uh, our friend uh, Clifford Van Beek had played this game and knew kind of what the setup was like, thought it was interesting, but wanted to have something that would have a little bit more lasting value. I mean, seriously, with this sort of game, how long do you think you can play with it until you get bored? I mean, maybe you play the game once or twice and then it goes back into the closet, which is probably one of the reasons why people didn't think much about it. The game was originally called Steel's Inside Baseball. 
There's a little description here I have of how the dice were read. You can read that. Here we go. Steel's Inside Baseball. This is the earliest advertisement I could find, which is from October 28th, 1913, so two weeks after the patent was issued, right? It cost a buck fifty. <clears throat> you wonder, oh, how can it be so cheap? Oh, it must have been because of, uh, you know, inflation has caused prices to rise or whatever. Now, you got to realize this is a buck fifty for a game that has no cards. I mean, this this is the game. This is everything that exists in the game, right? This is the whole thing. Right, and you can see one of the dice here was actually replaced. It should be three white dice. Um, I guess there are three white ones here. I don't know what this one here, here, I can't be part of the game, right? But, I mean, that's the thing, right? It's That's basically all you get. You get a couple of little, like, token things that are going to get lost, and you get the boards, and you get three dice, and that's it. There's no cards. There's no nothing else you can do. If you want to play with certain players, you want to play with the World Series winners, you want to play with, like, the Federal League or whatever, it's all up here. It's all in your imagination, right? And uh, then you start seeing these other ads. So I went around on newspapers.com and found tons of these, right? It's going to be hard for you to see this here on YouTube, but right here it says baseball steals inside baseball for a buck 25. This is from December 1913. So, I mean, Steel had pretty good um, reach. This is from Louisville, Kentucky. Steel was operating here out of Chicago, Illinois. He had pretty good reach. This is uh, an advertisement from Kennesaw, Wisconsin in the newspaper. Um, here's a mention in uh, the Muscatine Journal in Iowa from 1914, still called Steele's Game of Baseball is what it's called here, because he changed the name. Um, there was an advertisement in the Philadelphia Inquirer for uh, people, kids presumably, to go out and sell this game, to buy it, I think, for a buck each, a buck per copy, and then sell it for a little bit more for their own markup. Um, here's another issue of the St. Nicholas Advertisements, from what I think is November 1915, depending on what else is in there, where again, you can send a, a dollar for a game and for an outfit for an agency, you can sell it, right? What does this sound like? It sounds kind of like a, an MLM scheme. And it really does sound like a scam when you know what the game consists of. You're like, there's really not much to it. You could make the game yourself if you really wanted to. You don't have to have all these parts. Um, this one is from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram in December 1914. I think that this actually should be November 1914, not 1915. We can go back and check up on that. Um, and when we look into this, and we skip past all of the um, things that are not appropriate for um, racial slurs, um, we will see here somewhere a listing of this game. Here it is, Steals a Game of Baseball, 50 cents. Maybe it wasn't such a great seller after all. But if you go trust this ad in the American Stationer in March 1915, you would think it was because he claims that they sold 100,000 copies of it in the last six months of 1914. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. 100,000 copies of this in six months in 1915 or 1914, if that were true, this game would be everywhere today. I don't believe it. I don't believe it for a second. That's a lie. That's a bull-faced lie. But Steele kind of knew how to do marketing. I did some other research on the guy. I think he was the same Charles M. Steele who worked for the Ford Motor Company in like 1909, 1910, selling uh, early Ford cars. So he knew what he was doing in terms of advertising, right? Play the World Series over again in your own home every evening. This is from the Grand Forks Daily Herald in North Dakota, right? And this is the uh, not the name of Steele. This is the R.B. Griffith Company, which was selling the game for $1. Um, and uh, here in 1916 in Houston is the last I could find about Steele's baseball game. 69 cents is what it cost at the time. Um, the claim here is we'll make any play that can be made on the diamond, which is not true, but whatever, it doesn't matter. This is the most fun of the advertisements. This is what we'll round this one up with. This is from December 19th, 1915, the Chicago Tribune. Steele was able to get members of the Chicago Cubs, Chicago White Sox, and the uh, Federal Leaf Chicago team I think they're called the feds, um, to testify to how great this game was. He also somehow got um, players on a baseball world tour to bring this game with them and play with it and talk about how great it was. I don't know if they actually took the game with them or not. I mean, the idea that grown men are going to play a game which has no dice or anything in it is a little bit out there. But it's pretty interesting. What you notice in this advertisement, by the way, despite the similarities between the game and national pastime, is the luck of phrases, is the lack of phrases like you are the manager, you know, or anything about like realism. It's just like, oh, you know, everybody becomes a fan when this is on the table. The parlor or, um, or living room fades away. In its place appears the vision of the baseball field. The thrill of the great game enters the veins. Action follows action. 
one tense gripping situation follows another so rapidly that the breath that the breathless interest is sustained. Time flies away on the wings of pleasure, and outside attractions cease to call to the family where Steele's game of baseball has entered. Right? I mean, maybe not so much. Right? It would have been nice if you had some player cards. There's a claim here that there's over a million absorbing combinations. I suppose over the course of nine innings, there might be a million different combinations. But I'll tell you what: in each um, one of these situations, there's about 56, and most of them are either strike or ball. So, I mean, so much for this game being such a great one. Um, there is a question of timing as well, because people will say this game started in 1911. What I have here is a legal notice that was published in the Interocean in Chicago. This is from October 14th, 1913, but you can find it published weekly for about three weeks in a row. That um, is the incorporation of the Charles M. Steele Corporation, which sold the game, which tells me that this game started up for sale in 1913. Now, the co-partnership extended through uh, September 1923, but you'll notice, as I uh, said before, that this game kind of stopped going up for sale in 1915. So you can come to your own conclusions about what that means. Now, what does this mean for us? Not that much. I mean, I think that this means that it's pretty clear to me that Van Beek was influenced by the game because the boards look almost the same. There's another little thing that happens here as well. I'll show you this really quickly. This is bigger when you read about it. Um, on Steele's patent, instead of saying base is empty, it says none on bases, which is a really unusual phrase. You've already read about that, by the way, because my post about that's already come out. Guess what? In Van Beek's patent, it also says none on bases. I know that this is an unusual phrase because I went through and I looked at newspapers.com. It does exist in old newspapers, but it usually exists in the context of there are two outs and the ninth inning and there are none on bases as some dramatic things happens before the home team ends up winning the game through some amazing fashion. You know, That's usually when none on bases is used in the newspapers. Now, I don't think that this means that Van Beek really copied much of anything. If anything, Steele copied this game from all of the other dice baseball games that came before. Right? There's a difference between those games and the games that we play, um, because in the games that we play, we care about realism and we're interested in that stuff. Having said that, though, this is another little thing that we can put in our collection and our thinking about these old dice baseball games and what influenced what and who influenced who. Right? Van Beek probably was not, you know, a saint. I mean, his company went out of business and he claimed that the printer did. He was more of a saint than J. Richard Seitz. We'll get to him later. Right, and I think he was probably more of a saint than Charles M. Steele, who um, ran a company that looked like complete fraud to me. Um, but, you know, Van Beek needs to get credit for this. He needs to get credit for doing what he did. I am still upset, and this is almost 20 years, or over 20 years after those old APA journal issues were published. I'm still upset that we went to such great lengths trying to figure out, oh, who influenced Van Beek, and it must be that these games are this string of innovation or whatever. There is a little bit of the string of innovation, but man, Van Beek did a lot in his own. We should give him some credit for it. I don't know what you think about this, but I think that you know the man deserves his due. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye.